Our next speaker, Rodney, can I invite you forward, please? Yeah. Uh, yep, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, hi, I'm Rod Ubrian from the University of Canberra. And back, officer. And um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the work we've been doing um, in conjunction with the ACT government, uh, looking at nutrient loading and Lake Tuggeranong and how that contributes to our cyanobacteria blooms. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people as the traditional owners on the land we meet and where this work was done, acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging, and especially recognise their continuing connection to the land and water. Okay, I'm going to speak a little bit about background to cyanobacteria blooms and nutrient loading, how they're linked, especially in the Tuggeranong catchments. Think about some of the sources of nutrients to Lake Tuggeranong, the importance of event flows in our catchments, and look at some current work that we're doing. So I'm not going to de delve deeply into anything, because there's lots of research there, but I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview about what we've been doing in the last couple of years. And thanks, Ralph, you touched on lots of topics that I'll delve into a little bit. Um, so Lake Tuggeranong was filled in 1989. And as we know, we've got continuing water quality issues. Um, and these water quality issues really manifest in cyanobacteria blooms in the lake. We know they're toxic, or at least have the potential to be toxic. They re reduce the aesthetic qualities. Um, with scum on the water and also a smell, which reduces our, um, I suppose, our recreational and aesthetic values we get from the lake. But we also have environmental problems associated with reduced biodiversity, where you get a monoculture of cyanobacteria in the lake rather than a nice diverse system. So it's a significant problem. Cyanobacteria typically need sunlight, water temperature. We have plenty of sunlight in a Canberra summer. Water temperature usually sits at 25, 26 in summer on the surface of Lake Tuggeranong in the upper layer. And I'll speak a bit, little bit about the layers of lake. The lake breaks into three layers, a surface layer, a mixed layer, and a cooler layer down the bottom. And they're all important. Cyanobacteria in still water where you get that separation. It allows the cyanobacteria to outcompete other phytoplankton species in the water column. But what I'm going to speak mostly about today is the nutrient availability and the nutrient sources to the lake that cyanobacteria needs, because that's where I think we can influence the cyanobacteria blooms, especially at a community level. Um, those, before I go on to those nutrients, typical Tuggeranong cyanobacteria blooms happen from December to March. They get worse as the season goes on generally. I've seen them persist into April, but typically December to March. Um, the dominant species varies, not just between years, but in years as the season goes on, as the nutrient dynamics change in the lake. But that's a story for another time. It is an interesting story. Um, there's often, amongst the dominant species, toxins producing species. This doesn't mean they're producing toxins at the time. Algae, uh, though the cyanobacteria complex, sometimes they produce toxins, sometimes they don't. But there is almost always um, toxin producing species amongst the dominant species in the blooms. Okay, I said I'd speak about nutrients. Um, well, when we think about lakes, you have internal and external nutrient loading to lakes. External, it's pretty simple. It's what's coming in from the catchment it comes in through our stormwater system or concrete channels in Lake Tuggeranong. Um, both the concentration, so the amount of nutrient per unit of water, and the volume are both really important. And they're generally highest in event flows. But I'll touch more on that in a minute. We also have internal loading to consider. In a lake, we get lots of sediment and organic matter coming into the lake. That sediment deposits in the bottom of the lake, so you get a legacy build-up of nutrients in the lake associated with your sediment. I mentioned the layers in the lake previously. In that bottom layer, you get um, chemical conditions over summer where that nutrient releases from the sediment and moves up into the water column. 
One of the first bits of work we did in Lake Chagrinong was to think about whether external or internal nutrient sources were more important. And this told us so there's about four times more nutrients generally from those external catchment sources than we're getting internally from the lake. Not saying they're not both important, but to control the situation, external nutrient sources are far more important initially. So if we know that, if we know external sources are highly important, need to know the when, what, where, why kind of questions. Do they come in base flow or events? What time and what nutrient forms? Still lots of questions to answer there. Um, I'm not going to delve deeply into this, but um, I've got an example and some general information that answers this really well. When we have rainfall in the catchments, and the larger rainfall event, the more this occurs. We have lots of movement of water through the catchment. The more rainfall, the higher intensity of rainfall, the quicker it moves through the catchment, the more material it tends to collect, and the more nutrients, either in with soil particles and organic matter, and also dissolved form, it tends to collect. Um, the figures, and I'm not gonna speak to them about a lot, but they come from 2019-20 season when we had a really dry period and a big rainfall event. It just really clearly tells this story. Um, so when we get these rainfall and large movements through the catchment, we have lots of nutrients move through the catchment into the lake. Um, and I will, have I got a pointer? I don't, I do have a pointer my finger. Um, you can see in the top figure, um, in the grey, right there, when the, um, when the rainfall come, we had in the lake in this year about a doubling of the total phosphorus concentration. Now phosphorus we consider the key nutrient for cyanobacteria blooms. But I suppose more worrying than that, when it rains, about 50 to 60 per cent, and Ralph mentioned this, of our nutrients moving through the catchment are in a dissolved form. So we had a two-fold increase in total nutrients, but a six-fold increase in dissolved phosphorus associated with this event. So all of a sudden, we've got a whole heap of bioavailable nutrient in our water column. The cyanobacteria response to this, of course, is to increase, and there's a week or so's lag, generally, when those nutrients hit the water, and we see huge increases in the um, cyanobacteria community and the biomass in the lake. And also, in this case and often, you see a change in the community composition, so it's different species too. Not always the way, this time it went from less toxic to more toxic species. It's not always the way, but it often changes with these events. Um, so if we know these external nutrients are a significant issue, so the next question is, and it's kind of where the Leaf Collective hardly comes in, What's the catchment nutrient sources? Because to control them, we need to know where they're coming from. Are they point sources? Are they diffuse all over the catchment? Are they link to land uses. They vary between surface types associated with certain characteristics. And these are some of the questions that we've been trying to answer over the last couple of years and moving and continuing with now. Um, I suppose I'll highlight one study uh, that we did that looked specifically at land uses. So what we did in the figure on the left there, we mapped the catchment um, for different land use types. Um, all over the catchments that drain into Lake Tuggeranong, then subdivided into 27 different subcatchments. For those subcatchments, we knew the proportion of land area that was associated with each of the land use types and the land use types you can't read them there probably, were commercial, recreational, residential, roads, sporting and rural land uses. We knew the proportion of land use type, but we could also sample at the bottom of these catchment areas. And based on the area, we could attribute the nutrient addition to each of these areas. So what that allowed us to do was build a model and create a regression relationship between the proportion of land use area in each of these catchment areas and the nutrient addition from each of these areas. I'm not gonna go any deeper into the stats and modeling than that, but what it allowed us to do 
was have a look at all the relationships between those land uses. And we found specifically that below sports fields, we were seeing an increase in nutrients, but specifically an increase in dissolved nutrients. Um, and it's not surprising, in a dry time, you look at a, a map of Canberra and the sports fields are like little oases in the environment. And my kids, you know, my kids play sport on the weekends and we want those sports fields. So it's not a minute and not a question of getting rid of them, but it's a question of how we can manage them. And I've seen in recent times, you go out to Canberra and the bioswales are below the sports fields there. And it's a really fantastic management then have to get rid of some of those nutrients that move off these sports fields. Um, the fact we didn't see lots of other relationships was in a way disappointing, but it's still a result and it tells us that nutrients from a, or the contribution of nutrients from a land use perspective isn't specifically associated with those other land uses, but it's more diffuse. So we need to look to other areas. The other thing that was interesting when we did this work so we often saw random, in time and space, large spikes in the nutrient concentration that just come up randomly and you think about why they're there and there's no obvious reason. We put it down to some kind of contamination events. Um, very difficult to manage though because they're random in space and time so you can't target. Um, from this work also recognised we know what runs in and out of the lake itself quite well but the hydrology in the catchments, we used a hydrology model when we did this work. It was a basic hydrology model. It's something that I'd like to improve and that we're working on at the moment. We need to consider the nutrient inputs from specific surface types. We've got students working on there and activities in the catchments, as well as the land use that we looked at more broadly in the past. So there's other things that we can look into. Um, the ongoing work. As I mentioned, I would like to improve that understanding of the hydrology because it's not just the nutrient sources, it's really important to understand how they move through the catchment to understand um, yeah, how, how they're moving to the lake and also to understand where we can best put management assets in place in the catchments. Um, we need to understand what diffuse sources, if we know that nutrients are diffuse, need to understand what diffuse sources we can manage. And we're here for the Leaf Collective, so what better example than leaves? Um, but when you estimate the contribution of leaves, you need to know what leaves are there, what the leachate is from the leaves of different species, what area they take up, and also how that's connected to stormwater. Because um, I suppose Tim's kind of example of having those leaves beautifully composted, if we can get leaves falling and breaking down into those pervious areas, that's great. But when they fall onto an impervious surface, like we see in the gutters and things, it's a completely different scenario because they're directly connected to our stormwater and our lakes. Um, sewer ingress, something that I think was mentioned before. It's something because of the high dissolved nutrient loads or nutrient concentrations that we get in in the lake, we're thinking where are they coming from? I don't think we've got a significant problem with sewer, but it's something that's been in the back of our mind for a while since we've been studying Lake Tugger, and I'm gonna be really nice to either, to kind of eliminate it, or alternatively, if it is a problem, no. Um, interested in building sites, things where there's disturbance in the catchment. At the building site, we know we've got lots of disturbance, lots of materials used, you get lots of nutrient and soil movement with that. And similar from verges, some of our past work where we've looked at nutrients around verges, where you get people parking on the verge and um, I suppose um, pedestrian use on a non-hardened surface, you get lots of disturbance. And when you get large rainfall events and things on that, you get lots of movement of things through the catchment. So that's some of the work um, that we're moving on um, and that's yeah that's where I'm at thank you for the invitation it's been great to come out and speak to everyone tonight
wall, that's really, really high. Our final speaker for tonight, Martin, I'll raise this for you and put it straight back up. He's just going to come across and join us. <laughs> right, okay. Yeah, I'm Martin from, I'm the Southern ACD Catchment Group Water Watch Coordinator. I've got a few water watchers in the room. Um, so basically you can go home now because you know what I'm going to talk about. Um, it's a bit of a departure from what the other guys, they've talked about the technical stuff around um, nutrient sources into the lake. I'm going to depart into where the community gets involved in actually seeing the results of this and actually measuring what's going on. So we've actually got a lot, we're producing, Water Watchers are producing a lot of data that actually feeds into the knowledge about where we know nutrients are coming in, when they're coming in, and the sort of concentrations that are being, the, the numbers that are being talked about. So what did that just do? I've gone the wrong way. Okay, what is Water Watch? So I've been asked to come and say, what is Water Watch? And I think a lot of people here will just know anyway, so I'll be fairly quick. It's a citizen science program where people, regardless of their, their background level of expertise, are trained up to go out and be like neighbourhood watch for waterways with a chemistry set every month, checking how things are going. Um, so, Community Water Quality Monitoring Network. It also, through that connection with the waterways, including Lake Tuggeranong, all the lakes in, um, Tug in the Tuggeranong region, as well as the other rivers and streams, they become involved in active protection and management of the waterways. You become quite literate in what's going on. Um, and the network is made up of, as I said, it's I've got school groups, I've got scout groups, and I've got uh, land care groups um, that people will know of and be part of here and um, further afield. So what does Water Watch do? So every month, your teams go out and they do a what they call a physical a phys chem test of the water. So you go out with a chemistry set and we check for the things that Rod's been talking about and Ralph's been talking about, the nutrients, the phosphate. We actually measure the phosphate, the available phosphate in the water sample. We also test for the nitrate levels, which is another nutrient. It doesn't affect cyanobacteria so much, but it does also drive <laughs> bacterial activity in the waterway. So we check for nitrates. We check for the turbidity, how much mud and sediment's coming into the lakes. We check how salty the water is, the pH, temperature, and the amount of oxygen. <coughs> so there's a whole suite of parameters that people check every month. Twice a year, <coughs> we um, get the nets out, the Sam and I did recently, and we go to various waterways, including Lake Tuggeranong, Stranger Pond, Point Up Pond, and we have a look at what's living in around the waterways. And these gives, this gives us a really good feel for what's actually going on with the waterway. Some of you remember the, it was in the media last year about the catchment health indicator report for Lake Tuggeron. Can you remember that? It got the, there was that thing about worst, worst reading ever, worst scorecard ever. Really, <coughs> one of the drivers behind that was the sheer lack of aquatic creatures that we found in the lake. We'd found that for some reason, just the sheer, the, the nutrient levels coming in, as well as the cyanobacteria that was happening, the sheer volume of nutrients that were in that, the lake as well were dropping out some of the um, aquatic organisms we'd expect to see there. Every two years we then go around, we also go around and we look at the riparian condition. And this is a bit of a moot point around urban waterways, especially urban lakes. The riparian condition around urban lakes is historically fairly bad because the complexity of vegetation around these waterways just isn't there. And when we compare that to natural creeks and streams, there's a real contrast. Um, what have I got there? Some pictures. Okay, there's, there's just some images of places where we do go and do water testing. That's the log jam down at Thawa that some people might know of. Um, I think that's also most of those photos are down from Thawa too. That over in the far corner there is a picture of a couple of people who are involved in a tree planting program that's happening down at Outward Bound called Riparian Rescue. Um, that's come out of Water Watch. They, they, were water, they were involved in Water Watch for quite some time, so they were connected with the, the river and what have you, and they knew that through being part of the network, when the funding became available to do some riparian work, um, Outward Bound said, yep, we'll have some of that. And so there's a connection between the monitoring and actually doing stuff towards action around waterways. Um, what have I got here? Oh, more words. 
Water watch groups can determine the health of a waterway and catchment and, and I did change and if they're it's supposed to say and if catchments are improving. Um, based on our finding, water watch groups have initiated solutions to improve waterway. That's what the pictures are all about. So identifying feral, feral pests in nature reserves. A lot of uh, water watchers pick up on other things that they're seeing as well as water quality issues. They pick up on feral pigs in the national park, they pick up on weed prevalence, they pick up on algal blooms too. A lot of our water watchers will turn up on site, they'll see the beginnings of a bloom, send me the photos, and that will go through to usually EPA and others. Um, where am I up to? Laying the ground work for establishing an action plans for waterways in partnership with multiple stakeholders, identifying sources of pollution and leading to remedial action. They're the, the sort of the the big picture aims of the water quality monitoring that we do. In the Southern ACT, our patch, um, we're part of the Upper Murrumbidgee Water Watch program. The Southern ACT includes that area with a black outline around it. So it includes, well, actually, no, that's wrong. That's the whole of the, that's the ACT, the black outline. The Southern ACT, we cover <coughs> the Tuggerong area you can see in there, which is what most people are probably interested in. But the Water Watch program includes the Paddy's River, Gudgeby, Nace, Cotter, that whole, and the Murrumbidgee as it comes through the ACT, the grey area, and the lower Murrumbidgee. That's all part of where my water watchers work. So it's a huge area. Lake, Lake Tuggeranong is really just a small feature of the whole program. Um, what have I got? I've got more words. <laughs> I should have run through this first. So we've got nine sub catchments in the southern ACT, trip has gone through. We've got, across that, we've got 70 sites. So around Lake Tuggeranong, we've got, I mean, Sam up the back there, she's got three all of her own. She covers across, across two catchments. Um, Tuggeranong has one, two, three, four, five, six. It's got six sites around Lake Tuggeranong. Um, and so 70 right across the whole region. I've got 40 volunteer groups. Now that's groups, some of the groups have half a dozen people as part of them. Some of those groups will be a scouting group, but there'll be about 12 or more kids and leaders going out. Uh, one of those will be a school group as well. Uh, biannual, yeah, and we go out and we check for what's living in all of the waterways in those nine catchments. And we go around and we check, every two years we check the riparian condition of every single of those 70, those 70 sites. And it all goes towards the annual catchment health indicator report that we write every year based on all of the information that the volunteers gather. And it's the big health record of all this area, including Lake Tuggeranong. Uh, this picture is just to show how busy we are. And the great, we've got everyone. So there's, there's Lake Tuggeranong with a um, team there. That, that student was working on Lake Tuggeranong as part of the ACT Science Mentors Program, a project there. Um, that's your old digs, Glennis. That's your pond down at Lanyon High School with one of the students there when the trek... Pro landed. Yep, that's the trek <laughs> program, I think. Um, I've forgotten her name. Um, she's catching bugs. Uh, in, the middle, in the middle there, sitting in a, on the rocks at the Gudgeonby River, that's the scouting group, uh, all wearing hard hats because it's a fire-affected area and there were bits of tree falling around the time. So they weren't actually allowed into that area unless they were wearing proper PPE to make sure they didn't get clobbered by bits of tree. Not just schools, we've also got community. There's uh, Ross Nee, I think he's, he's involved in, in catchment work. A few people know of Ross. That's him in his volunteering time with me down the bottom below Lake Tuggeranong, checking the nutrient, checking all those parameters I mentioned coming out of Lake Tuggeranong down at Tuggeranong Creek. Um, very interesting, the difference between the nutrient levels we get there and what we find in the lake. And we, we occasionally get spikes as it travels through. And not only community, students, I have professionals. I've got a good couple of good teams of parks and conservation rangers who do the areas where members of the public can't get in. So that's um, a bunch of rangers up at Vanity's Crossing. So we, we've got three sites on the Cotter River that we keep an eye on as well. Um, water education is a... Water Watch actually came out of education. It was the big driver of through st Streamwatch back in the day. It's branched more into citizen science and community, but we've still got a big educational element. Uh, the students over there on the right, that was Lake Tuggeranong college students, and they were actually doing a riparian survey up and down Lake Tuggeranong. Uh, sorry, 
Lower Tuggeranong Creek. So that spot where Ross was, that's where they're doing the, a veg survey. Um, out at Tibimbilla, I think that's Trinity College, students doing some water testing prac out at um, Tibimbilla Reserve. So we, we do a lot of that. And through getting involved with the education, we talk about, okay, you're measuring phosphorus, you're measuring nitrates, what do your readings look like? We use the scoring system with the kids on the worksheets Ross, um, Rod knows about, so they can tell me, is that a degraded score? Is that an excellent score? All right, why do you think you're getting a degraded score for your phosphates? So we have that very clear conversation about what you're measuring, what it means, and where is that possibly coming from? Um, what have I got here? More words. Um, yeah, every, every level of education, primary, secondary, um, including kindergarten and tertiary. Work with a lot of students through CIT who are doing environment monitoring program. Tertiary students um, who are doing community engagement come out and do, will take on a, adopt a site for six months. Um, and also <coughs> big involvement through ACT Scouting. ACT Scouting have been really pushing to use WaterWatch as a vehicle for their environmental uh, engagement badge. It's a really simple road for them to get in, get involved in doing that work. And through WaterWatch, the the scouting groups also get involved. They, they got involved in some of the Namaji fire, post-fire recovery work as well. They went and did some work with um, one of, our, pro, one of our, our other project officers through the catchment group. Um, so some just some basic stuff. The, cat, the catchment health indicator program, it's been going in its current form since 2013. Waterwatch has been around since the mid-90s, even earlier. But in terms of this, this big report that we produce, it's really in its current form since 2013. And it, the upper Murrumbidgee, it covers everywhere from above Tantangra, so the headwaters of the, of the Murrumbidgee up, at, up in Kosciuszko where the feral horses are currently making a, a mess up there, right through Tantangra, down through Cooma, up through past the um, you know, Williamsdale, Breadbow, that area through the ACT, through Yass, and to Barranjuk Dam. So that's our, that's our entire catchment, that's our entire area of the program. So there's four, four big areas. Southern ACT is one of them in the ACT. We've got Cooma Water Watch, which covers pretty much everywhere south of the ACT that's part of the Murrumbidgee. So that includes Brebo, Numerella, Kybian, all those rivers. And then we've got Malonglo Catchment Group, who cover that whole section east of Canberra, which is the Queanbeyan River, and flows through into Lake Billy Griffin. And then we've got um, Ginandera Catchment Group, which also look after the Yass area. So they cover Ginandera right through to Burrinjuk. Um, within that, there's 2,000 surveys every year. It's pretty, pretty impressive. They're big numbers, really big numbers. It's a lot of data that we're going through and checking, but it's, it's like eyes on the ground. We've, we've got a spy network, second to none. If it's going on, we know about it. So nothing gets past us. We've got 237 sites in the Upper Murrumbidgee. I reckon that, that waxes and wanes. It'll probably go up. As I say, Sam does half of them. <laughs> um, we've got, well, I say 200 volunteers. That's what we see. It, it, it waxes and rains, wanes around that. I'd say it's probably more than that on any year because we've got people who come along and do the bugs, just do the bug survey and don't do the other stuff. And I'm keeping an eye out for anyone telling me, t tell me to shut up. I can't see three minutes. Oh, three minutes, Pff, ages. <laughs> and we've now found that now, because of the work that we've done, there's a, there's a fair amount of this that's um, synthesising all this information and, churning, and turning into something that's, that's legible, which is the, the program. But the bulk of this work is done by just community members getting that information for us. Because without that, we'd be stuck. And now, because that information is so extensive and so comprehensive, we're now um, pretty much integral to the ACT State of the Environment report. Ralph, would you agree? Yep. Now, I'm, just, I'm looking to the ACT government people, and they're, okay. they're nodding at me. Because if they go like this and say, shut up, Martin, I know I've got to stop talking. So, yes, we, we feed into to that. Icon Water use our information. Um, External agencies, I've had other universities, I've had uh, researchers from other un um, outside the ACT region look at information for Tibimbilla doing platypus research. They've used the data coming out of that. It's just, it's a great, it's open access, it's information that people can grab and use and look at. 
Um, if you want to have a look at Lake Tuggeranong, you want to see what's happened, or 10 years, lakes really, over the last 10 years, go in and to the ACT, Google ACT Water Watch, and you'll find the chip reports under data. And it says chip reports, and they come up as PDFs, and you can just click on those. You don't have to download them. You can just read them on the website. And you can have a bit of a scroll through and have a look, and they're very easy to understand, and they're like a child's report card. They get a scoring for all the different things we measure, whether it's good, bad, ugly. They get a scoring for the bugs, good, bad, ugly, and the riparian condition. And then there's a blurb about, well, why is it like that? And I think that's probably... That's it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'll stand on tippy toes. There are two questions for you straight up, leave it. Um, first one, how do I get involved in Water Watch? I've got a card in a bag somewhere. <laughs> yes, you Google, AC, you Google um, ACT Water Watch, there'll be a link, there'll be a hot link to, do I need to stand back there to say this? <laughs> so, I want to get involved. Um, but wait, there's more. <laughs> it's simple, you just Google Water Watch, you go to the first thing that Google or Firefox brings up, you click on that, you'll probably end up at Upper Murrumbidgee Water Watch site. Somewhere in there, there'll be a contact us. You can annoy uh, Wu or whoever's now going to be sitting in Wu's role, who will then say, I don't know what to do with this person, and will then send them to the Water Watch coordinators. Or down the bottom of the page, there's, hot, there's hyperlinks to the catchment groups. Southern ACT is mine. Um, Malonglo Conservation Group's there. Gin and Dera Con catchment groups there, and I think Cooma Water Watch is there if you live south of the border as well. It doesn't matter who you talk to because we'll put you in the right direction. We're a network, we're linked, so there's no mystery. Oh, okay, you left a red turn, I've got my glasses. Yeah, so the question is, do the, um, do the drains in the northern suburbs affect Lake Tuggeranong? No. <laughs> right, do the drains in the northern suburbs affect Lake, Lake, Lake Tuggeranong? No. Basically, the water that flows into Lake Tuggeranong pretty much comes from the Tuggeranong, Waniassa, Camba. The northern sort of catchment area is pretty much the hills around Waniassa and above Camba Village, those hills up there. And then south, pretty much as far as I think Monash and Fadden, when you get to about Benython, I think they then flow into Stranger Pond. So anywhere in Belconnen, north, anywhere north of um, Lake Billy Griffin is either flowing into Lake Jindera or Lake, uh, Lake Billy Griffin. Any more? No. Oh, good. Okay. Bye. Thank you. I'll put a, put a round together for Martin. That was excellent. <laughs> so great to hear about the many different ways that people have got the waterways and we're looking at it. So again, one of the aims is just to make it clear this is a shared responsibility and the more data that comes in, as you can see, it's now hit the state of the environment report. This is how change actually starts to happen. So keep up the great work to those actually involved. Now, I was actually asked, um, I'll answer this particular one, uh, eucalyptus leaves okay to be composted? One of the reasons we actually took a really specific focus on the eucalypts in the second six weeks that we worked on Leaf Collective was to actually understand that. And some of the eucalypt leaves, actually, if you ever look at the base of the tree, you can actually see there might be a completely naked bit of dirt. That is a particular type where it's falling down and it will be doing something, and Tim will be able to speak a little bit more eloquently about this, I think, than I can. That's a sign that maybe don't stick those leaves in your compost pile. So it's my simple way of saying, this is how you figure it out but everything else is fair game. So if the tree has lots of green stuff growing underneath it, that means it is actually dropping all of its things and it's not killing anything underneath it. So you can compost most eucalypt leaves, but that, there's a caveat. There is a certain type that you should avoid. So learn that, know that, and just do it by looking underneath that particular tree. Now, I've got a good few questions that have come in. I do think someone loved Tim's video with the mower as much as Tim. So it's come up in a question, and just give me two seconds to come in and find it. So the question for you, Tim, and I'm going to hand the floor to you in a minute, and you can tackle that eucalypt one if you feel like it as well. Why did you have a catcher on the mulching mower? Trick of, trick of the trade. Um, 
there must be a little plug that's underneath the catcher, and if I take the catcher off, it gets left on jobs. So <laughs> it'll get left behind. So the catcher and the mulching, the mulching plug just sit there. And basically, I don't. I rarely use the catcher. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, that's beautiful. Okay, so there's a couple of questions that have come in around, and I'm I'm not sure who to direct this one to. So someone's going to have to nominate from our panel for me. But the questions have actually come in around some of the street sweeping and what happens with the leaves. Um, because there's been a few questions around contamination, like some roads are going to be more polluted with more contaminants than others. Um, what do we actually know about that? And how much can we actually sort of sort that out? And this one might actually be for you, Rodney. Um, so I'm just gonna do two questions in one so that you can sort of come up and, and speak about some of these things. Do eucalypts, have as much effect as deciduous leaves? Like, have you actually learned a little bit about which leaves are doing what? I'll, I'll speak to the second one. I can't speak to the first one. I don't know where the street sweep leaves go to. Um, uh, yeah. yep. um, with, uh, with the different leaves, so at the moment we've got a few students um, doing work on, because we're interested in this leaf question at the moment, we've got a few students doing work on the leachate rates from both eucalypt leaves um, and multiple species of eucalypt leaves and multiple species of exotic leaves. Um, what we find is the eucalypt leachate is fairly consistent. The leachate of nutrients and carbon from the exotics varies. Some is super quick and super high some are actually some it's generally a quicker leachate and i think that's to do with the kind of waxy coating like the cuticle coating that you get on eucalypt leaves often they leach a little bit slower um, a consistent more consistent between species the exotics have more variability between species some leach really high and some have relatively low leaching concentrations um, yeah it's still something we're learning about in some of the leach, it's an extension to this question, we're also interested in lots of these leachate experiments get done in an environmental chamber with ultra pure water. And I sat down and started thinking about it, and it's crazy. In the street, you've got gutter water or stream water and things, you've not got controlled conditions. So I haven't got any data for you or results really but we've started doing some of these experiments outside and instead of using ultra pure water, using either stream water or rain water that will have some bacterial communities in it and be more natural and indicative of the system, we've started to do them through wet and drying cycles and different things which you kind of get in a gutter and trying to mimic the rainfall environment, including little pools in artificial gutter systems. So we're moving away from a leachate system it's kind of your maximum, that's the potential leachate, to something would be more realistic. And it's interesting, when I think of the original setups as the maximum, what we're starting to see is when you leachate a leaf once and dry it, it's what happens in a one-time leachate experiment. And they kind of say that the leachate level increases and then levels off. And that what's le that's what leaches from your leaves. When in fact, you clean that water out and replace it, it almost resets the cycle, like there's an equilibrium between the leaves and the water. So yeah, I'm skeptical about some leech, leachate leaf results, but it's something that I've, we've got a couple of students um, and a group doing some work on at the moment to understand these things more. So sorry, that was a long answer with a few tangents, but hopefully some interesting stuff in there. Um, I think we all look forward to seeing the results of those student studies because it, it is very obviously deep and scientific but also incredibly interesting as we actually go through. So I think we've determined now that a few of these next questions are going to be for Ralph um, to tackle and he, he may or may not know direct answers for some of these. Um, but one of the questions has been around the contaminants in leaves that are actually out on the roads 
And what work, if any, has been done? What do we currently know about that? And is it safe for us to take that in and put it into our compost? So I'm going to hand that to you, Ralph, if that's okay. Um, thanks, Sharon, and, and the questioner. Um, we haven't uh, looked at this in detail, but I can tell you this. Um, TCCS, uh, who collect this, you know, street leaves out of the gutter, take them to the tip, and they're, they're, that's where they're um, dealt with because they have found them to have some levels of pollution in them. I would say um, leaves that are on your verge, i.e. not in the gutter, are safe, would be my judgment because they've just come out of the tree. Leaves that's come into the verge and then just blown into the gutter 10 minutes ago is safe. If it's been in there and it's been driven over and it's had water come in over it and stuff like that, it'll probably have some pollution from the road, um, from tires being broken down, oil dropping, that kind of stuff. So I wouldn't be using stuff that's been sitting in the gutter for a long time in my compost, in my garden. Uh, and as I say, TCCS take it to the tip and put it in a place where it doesn't get recycled. So um, I will actually also give a plug to Water Watch. In my inbox right now, uh, my email inbox, is uh, an analysis um, of data looking at Lake Tuganon and the passage of, or looking at water quality above and below and seeing the effect that Lake Tuganon has. So we, we use Water Watch data in our working environment to answer questions. So um, it's very useful data, not just for reporting as in report cards, but also for everyday management. Thank you so much, All right, and this one we've decided, everyone else on the panel handballed this one to you, Ralph. So this is yours. <laughs> so can sporting fields reduce the amount of fertilizer to stop nutrient runoff? I think anybody managing green space can look at what they're doing to um, to reduce the amount of fertilizer. And in, indeed, fertilizer in a playing field is a very expensive, as Tim, uh, Tim did some research for us, actually, and it's a very expensive, it's part of their expenses. And they, uh, at least some of the sector, the s sector that Tim looked at, they were managing that fairly closely, if, if I recall correctly, and uh, not, from our judgment, over-fertilizing. But that's not to say that in the past there hasn't been high levels of fertilizer use. And of course, that stuff's going to stick around in the soil and could come out slowly. So, um, so the, answer is, the answer to the question, and I'm sorry to be a little evasive on this, is we, we want to ensure that we're not, and that's both private and government, because government manages you know, playing fields, like Canba playing fields, for instance. Um, and so we are looking at that internally. As I say, Tim had a look at some of the private developers, and they, or developers, private uh, playing fields people, and they seem to be managing their, their, their uh, fertilizer pretty tightly. Is that, that's correct, isn't it, Tim? Yeah. 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 Just about to say, for those in the room, we now have Brooklyn in here who will actually come to you. Oh, there you go. Yeah, there's a two piece there. She's going to come to you with the microphone, and that's just so that the people who are watching online can still hear. Uh, I, I just had a question in regard to this. Uh, I was reading on the New South Wales EPA website that they have done quite a lot of research in using compost instead of artificial chemicals on the sports field because compost is actually also uh, holds a lot of water so it has this effect as well so I'm just wondering how how far is the ACT government aware of this and will you be doing some research or will you be implementing these kind of changes thank you thanks um, I'm not aware that doesn't mean that others are aware uh, or not aware of of that, and yes, we are doing research in that. So we've actually got a lot of officers looking into all these sort of little, all the various components of, of nutrients in the catchment that we are managing and trying to see whether there is uh, scope 
to reduce the amount of nutrients that we're using. So that is something we're actively looking at. I, I'm not personally aware of that research or, but you know, it's something we'll, we'll certainly look up having give, been given the heads up, yeah. I'm just wondering because they've done extensive research yeah. so it would be easy enough to coordinate sure. with them and not double up on doing another research again. Government is talking to government, so you can, no, of course, <laughs> we'll, we'll do that. Don't be yeah. silly, no. <laughs> Someone placed a question into the uh, series of questions online, which is directed to me, and one was, have we actually engaged with the Share, Watch app, Share Waste app? And the answer is we did try at the end of the first and between the second run. Um, that was indicated to us from community because they have a fantastic app, great, great things to do. We reached out and they haven't answered. So if anyone knows how or who um, and can make a nice, neat introduction, please do contact me because these are the sorts of things. Leaf Collective was called exactly that because it aimed to get behind the people on ground. So you've heard how some people have had involvement at various points as we've been trialling and the aim is just to continue to basically strengthen and grow so that it just becomes a normal conversation around what and how can we compost this, which bits are reasonable to think about. And composting, if you think about it, if you're a bit worried, it's gonna be in your dirt and turf for quite some time. So just use that sort of mindset to think it through. Like, is this something that you think is safe for you and, and yours as you actually start to approach it? But it's not too difficult to, to start to see that if the leaves have only just fallen down and you get them up pretty fast, they're still gonna be very, very useful for you to actually do. Does anyone else in the room have a question that they would like to pose to the panel? Oh, yep, I see a couple of hands. I'll come to you next, so I'll make sure we don't lose that thought. And if you could just direct it maybe to a person, if you have a specific person, or if you're not, and you just want to do it general, then I'll try and sort that out too. I'm not sure who'd be the appropriate person, but the question, would a large water wheel in the lake help or hinder the algal bloom? So when you say a large water wheel to circulate some water, yeah, yeah. Look, I think if you can circulate the water, you will absolutely favour um, non-cyanobacteria phytoplankton species that are much prefer preferential to have than your cyanobacteria. The risk is that if you circulate some of the water and not all of the water, what happens around the edge of that circulation area, you have release of nutrients from the bottom waters, and then when that mixes around the edges, instead of those nutrients released and staying near the bottom and only coming up to the top when you might have high winds or big inflows into the lake and mixing, you get some of those bottom water released nutrients being brought straight up to the top, and it's basically cyanobacteria food around the area. So if we could mix the whole lake effectively and easily, it would be a great solution. But I think it's a lot easier um, in theory than in practice. It's something that's been tried on a small scale in Lake Burley Griffin, and it's a great idea but wasn't super effective, um, or in fact, ineffective. Um, so yeah, it, it's a good thought. Mixing the lake is a great thing to do but it's really hard to do in a practical sense to effectively mix a water body that size without leaving some still zones down the bottom where you're going to get release and then you start to bring that to the top which becomes cyanobacteria <coughs> food. Sorry, just, just on that. Yep. Um, would that mean that the Captain Cook Memorial Fountain which drags water up and shoots it and it like disturbs a small area of Lake Billy Griffin, does that mean that that's probably not environmentally sound? Yeah, look, that's a good question. I don't, um, I don't know the dynamics of the fountain, how deep it's taking the water from and what it's, and what it's doing. I certainly wouldn't recommend to put something in a lake <laughs> like that. However, I suppose, I don't know, it's, it's a pretty, yeah, I know. It's a, it's, it's a pretty significant feature in a way. Yeah, I don't know whether that makes it good or, or bad or otherwise. 
But yeah, if it's taken water from the bottom and redirecting it to the surface layers, it would certainly be of concern. No, no. I just wanted to add a point to the uh, question before. Um, we are interested in looking at in-lake treatment of the algal blooms and things we can do to um, diminish, curtail, whatever, the algal blooms within lake. But almost all of that, the things that you look at and think about get overwhelmed by the nutrients coming in from the catchment. We've got to stop the nutrients coming in from the catchment. Not stop, but diminish the nutrient load coming in from the catchment or whatever you do in lake is just going to be temporary and probably ineffective. One of, the, one of the things that Water Watch picks up on very frequently when we're doing our, our testing for phosphorus, which is the, the key um, cyanobacteria food, we're, after a rain event, we're finding it, um, anyone familiar with Fadden? The drains going all, up, all the way up to the top of Isabella Drive and the shops up there, you've got the pipes coming out where it turns into a stormwater drain. We're finding phosphorus and nitrates at the same levels up that far in the catchment as we're finding down in Isabella Pond where that drain system comes into. So going back to <coughs> Rod's map of uh, that, that web of the red, the yellow arrows everywhere pointing around the catchment, to even start thinking about, it's a bit like trying to deal with the cholesterol once it's all piled up in your heart. Oh, now I'll deal with the cholesterol in my heart. I'm having a heart attack. All my arteries are blocked. I think I'll deal with that cholesterol. No, it's a systemic problem. It's right throughout the entire body of the catchment. Water Watch is picking up on that saying, these nutrients are right around through the catchment. So in lake, in your heart solutions, I suppose a stint would probably be great in the lake if we could put one in. <laughs> but really, you, the, 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 the horse is bolted. You're trying to, the, well, this leaf collective discussion is about trying to get that capture the, that pollution before it actually gets to the lake level because as Ralph said, it four times, every time we get a distant storm event, four times the amount of nutrients that's currently sitting in the lake is just force fed into the lake. It's just crammed on in there. So water wheels, water jets, oh, some of the stuff that was um, waved around back in the old BPB days, yeah. Bubbles, phosphor lock, there was every, every snake oil character in the, and that ever there was about a decade ago came in with all sorts of plans and wonderful fixes for things in the lake. They're all, they're all too, they're all too, by the time it got there, they couldn't deal with the, the sheer loads of, of nutrients coming in. That's, that's my little ad. Okay. You mentioned playing fields earlier. What is the difference you notice when you've got playing fields that are used professionally, when you've got subsoil drainage, et cetera, and that um, with the uh, water, because like obviously that water is used and, and reused because of the, the dr subsoil drainage. Yep, um, it's, it's a good question. Um, we didn't, at the level we investigated, we didn't differentiate it. We broke down the, uh, I suppose, the catchment land uses into playing fields and they were the playing fields that were actively fertilised and watered and we just saw that signal. Um, there is certainly, would certainly be differences in the age and management of those playing fields and what's coming from different ones. Something that we're doing now is trying to understand the hydrology because what we got, we got a nutrient signal and that was part of the total water that was going through the catchments or each of those little subcatchments, the 27 subcatchments, we're starting to now in our current work try and get a better understanding of the nutrient concentrations plus the runoff coming off those fields so we can determine a relatively accurate load. Because you can get a lot of these signals and often they're significant, what they contribute to the load at the lake, because if you think of playing fields as a proportion of your catchments, it's a small proportion. It may be a proportion that's manageable, maybe not. Is it cost benefit effective to manage that proportion? 
That's a question for Ralph, but if he's got that data and he knows how much of the load is coming from those playing fields, I suppose it gives you information to answer those questions. As for the different drainage, I'm sorry, I can't, um, I can't help you. We may get an indication of that in our current work. I know myself um, across a lot of this water quality work in multiple projects that I've done, I came to actually see soil like a sponge, like using it in the kitchen and its capacities to hold water or not. So if you start to really simplify it back down, um, there's a lot going on. So the, the more richness there is underneath the dirt, the better it's holding things, the more nutrients it's got access to. And Tim certainly opened up my world when he showed me just how really healthy soil looks and I think how little we've actually seen that sometimes if we're really critical and, and going out and just digging the little square hole. Um, I have one time for just one more question. So for those that have been throwing their hands up hard and fast, um, we're not going to be able to get through them all tonight. So I believe it was just over here somewhere, one final question, because it was up, that was five minutes ago. And even before, as everyone's starting to do, what I would actually like to do is sort of conclude it at this level so that the people online can head home and allow just a few more questions to actually be answered more naturally as we go forward, so. Thank you. I remember reading about the floating rafts in Lake Tigranong and they were supposed to do something for the algal blooms. Is my recollection correct? And if so, what do we learn from it? Um, so, the floating wetland in uh, Lake Tuganon was originally placed in the uh, bay of Village Creek, uh, right below where the gross pollutant trap is. We'd measure the pollution coming out of the gross pollutant trap, and it was actually releasing some pollution from the leaves and grass that get in there and then stew away. And then, so the amount of pollution coming out was greater than the amount of pollution coming in. So the and that was one thing. The second thing was we were concerned that the still water in that bay, pollution coming in, heat in summer, would create perfect conditions for algae to, you know, begin to begin to bloom, and then that would spread into the lake and kaboom. Um, the unfortunately, so we put the uh, flooding wetland in there with the idea it would actually physically um, would compete for light and for nutrients with the algae there. Fortunately, what we've learned from that trial is the hydraulic conditions there are too tough, i.e. the flow is fast and furious and it flipped that thing a couple times. You, you might have seen it got damaged. So we've moved it into the lake. Uh, it's still doing the job of absorbing nutrients, but it's not competing with any algae that might be, you know, being developed, uh, blooms that might be developing in that little bay. Um, so it's half, ha it's half successful in the sense that it'll be absorbing some nutrients, but it's, a, you know, relative, I mean, it's good. It'll be absorbing nutrients, but it's, you know, small area. It's not going to solve the problem of the algal blooms in Lake Tuganon. We would need lots more of those and, and lots more of other devices upstream or um, living infrastructure upstream and then a lot less pollution just being put into drains. And that combination, we hope and we'll know in about a year, uh, we'll know whether that's enough to actually solve the algal bloom problem. So we're bringing all these data together and all these information together to, so that we can actually predict how much we need to do to solve the algal bloom problem. And we'll know. So we know it's doing some of the job. We don't know. And we know it's not enough, but it's doing some of the job. Yeah. Now, remember, I said at the start, I promise to try and keep everything on time as best as I can. Can I just start by thanking everybody online, those of you that came to come into the room tonight to spend time with us? And I think from here, importantly, our speakers because between them all, they've shared in the brief time we've spent together, you can tell there's a wealth of knowledge sitting in this room. So Martin, Rodney, Tim, Ralph, thank you so much for your generosity. They have all given up their time to come here, just to be clear, so that you know, um, to share some of the work and the insights that we actually do. 
So for those in the room, I invite you, if you'd like, just to, by all means, have a chat. Uh, we have to definitely be gone by 8 p.m., but it's not like you have to rush away right now. So feel free to finish off those last questions that you've got. And Brooklyn tells me that there's actually some takeaway containers and lots and lots of food over there. I can't take it back on the plane. So yeah. if you've got somewhere, someone's to go, please grab a handful and take some home. I hate food waste. We don't want that. And finally, I just want to thank my team, uh, Louisa, Brooklyn. They've worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make the last six weeks of LEAF run. And thank you, team. It's been amazing. So everyone, thanks again for coming. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.